Hey, it's Darius, and so much energy goes into each I-75 video, but you know what? It's all worth it when you pass the CPA exam and notice the I-75 difference. So congratulations to Madeline for passing TCP. Are you struggling with the CPA exam because your course failed to fit your learning style? Get yourself on I-75 with me, Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference. Did you fail the CPA TCP exam? If you failed TCP, you probably just need a little help in what I consider five of the top TCP topics. Number one, individual tax planning. I'm sure you saw questions like that on the exam. And also gift tax and partnership tax planning, S-Corp tax planning, and also trusts. In this video, we're going to look at a question from each of these top five TCP topics. So watch this video to the end, and let's get you over the top with CPA TCP. Our first question is going to be on individual tax planning. And here we go. John had a tax liability of $50,000 last year. His AGI exceeded $250,000. His expected taxable income this year is $200,000 with a 25% tax rate. If John has no federal income tax withholding or tax credits, how much should he pay in estimated taxes this year to avoid underpayment penalties? And the answer is A, $45,000. First, we need to determine John's total tax liability for this year, given his expected taxable income of $200,000 and a tax rate of 25%. We can estimate his total tax this year to be $50,000. Now that we've estimated 100% of his current year tax liability to be $50,000, the IRS generally wants taxpayers to pay at least the smaller of 90% of the expected for the current year, and that would be $45,000, 90% of the $50,000, or 100% of the tax owed in the previous year. This rate is actually 110% if the AGI exceeded $150,000, which John's did. So John might have to pay in 110% of last year's tax. In John's case, 90% of his expected tax for this year, we said is 45,000, but what about 110% of previous year's tax? Well, they told us that previous year's tax was 50,000. So that means 50,000 times 110% equals 55,000. So to avoid underpayment penalties, John should pay the smaller amount, which is 45,000. The smaller of 90% of this year's tax 45,000 or 110% of last year's tax, which is 55,000. Notice that if his AGI did not exceed 150,000 last year, then we wouldn't have applied 110% to last year's tax. We would have only applied 100% to last year's tax. And that's because the IRS wants everyone to pay in 100% of last year's tax because it's easy to estimate. The only people who can't get away with that are those whose AGI exceeded 150,000 last year, then they have to apply 110% to last year's tax. And when we do that for John, we get 55,000, and then we compare it to 90% of his expected tax for this year, which is 45,000, and we take the lesser of the two. So it's always the lesser of 90% of this year's tax or 100% of the previous year's tax if your AGI is less than 150, 110% of last year's tax if your AGI exceeds 150. So this question asks, how much should he pay in in estimated taxes this year to avoid underpayment penalty? And the answer is A, 45,000, which is 90% of the expected tax for this year. If John pays in 45,000 this year in estimated tax, he can avoid underpayment penalties. So individual tax planning, big part of the TCP exam. Also, Gift tax. Let's look at a question on that. This question asks, Browning's taxable gifts in the current year after the exclusion are how much? And you probably saw something like this on the exam. Browning gave the following gifts in the current year. $18,000 directly to the university on the grandchild's behalf. So his grandchild was going to college and Browning gave the university $18,000 and said, this is for my grandchild's tuition. Is there any limit on gifts like that? No. Nothing there would be subject to gift tax because it was given directly to the university. 20000 to a public charity. Well, gifts to charity are unlimited, not subject to gift tax at all. 
27000 to his wife so she could take a cruise to Alaska. Well, you can give a gift to your spouse of any amount, and it wouldn't be subject to gift tax, and it doesn't matter what they use it for. So out of the first three, there's nothing subject to gift tax. We don't even care what the dollar limit is. But then we have 19000 gift to his sister for a surgical procedure. Well, if he would have taken the 19000 and gave it to the medical facility and said, this is for my sister's surgical procedure, then it would have been unlimited. It would have been like the 18000 given to the university on the grandchild's behalf. But it wasn't done that way. It says 19000 given to his sister, and then she took it and used it for a surgical procedure. So there we have to take into account what the annual exemption limit is. And the annual exemption limit currently is 17000 without having to worry about a gift tax. But this one crept over the limit by $2,000. So it looks like Browning's taxable gifts in the current year after the exclusion, $2,000. Letter C is correct. So the 18000 directly to the university, that's exempt. The amount of that gift is irrelevant. We don't apply the exemption because it was given directly to the university. 27000 to his wife exempt because gifts between spouses are unlimited. 20,000 given to the charity, public charity, that's unlimited. Only the 19,000 to his sister, that's going to be subject to gift tax if it's greater than the annual limit of 17,000. And since it's $2,000 over that limit, then the answer is Browning's taxable gifts after the exclusion in the current year, $2,000. Letter C is correct. Notice that in this question they did not provide the annual gift tax exemption limit of 17,000. You had to know it. On the exam, they might give you that amount. They might say, assuming the annual gift tax limit is 17,000, what's the correct answer? Or they might not give it to you like in this question. At I-75, you're gonna be ready for it either way. This is a good example of an exam question because not only did you have to know what is subject to gift tax and what isn't, but you also had to know the exemption amount for the current year. Okay, so gift tax, big topic. Also, individual tax planning. We saw that question on estimated taxes. Now let's go on to a question on partnership tax planning. All right, check this out. How does the qualified business income deduction apply to guaranteed payments received by a partner? How dare they ask about QBI, right? This is the perfect question on QBI because it's not just memorization. You have to know how does QBI, that 20% deduction, apply to income received from a partnership. Well, A says the QBI deduction is fully applicable to guaranteed payments. Is that true? No. And at I-75, you would have been ready for a question like this. How about B? Only 50% of the guaranteed payments qualify for the QBI deduction? No. C, the partner can choose whether to apply the QBI deduction to guaranteed payments? No. D, guaranteed payments are not eligible for the QBI deduction? That is correct. Letter D is correct. When partners receive guaranteed payments, those amounts are reported as ordinary income subject to self-employment tax and are not eligible for the QBI deduction. This means partners must include these guaranteed payments in their gross income and cannot reduce their taxable income with the QBI deduction for guaranteed payments. And here's where the tax planning comes in. Partnerships must choose between having partners receive a guaranteed payment versus having a partner receive a normal distribution. Because when partners get a payment from a partnership, it's either a guaranteed payment or it's a normal distribution. And if the partnership chooses to treat the payment as a guaranteed payment, then the QBI deduction does not apply to that amount. So the question asked, how does the qualified business income deduction apply to guaranteed payments received by a partner? And the answer is D, guaranteed payments are not eligible for the QBI deduction. So we went through three of the top five CPA exam TCP topics, individual tax planning, gift tax, partnership tax planning. Now let's look at S-Corp tax planning because the exam loves a question where a corporation starts out as a C-Corp, but then switches to S-Corp status. So let's look at this. Clyde Corp, calendar year C-Corp, elected S-Corp status at the beginning of the current calendar year. It had an asset with a basis of 50,000 and a fair market value of 75,000 on January 1st. So at the date they elected S Corp status, they had this asset that had appreciated from its days of being a C Corp. The asset was sold during the current year for 67,000. Is that important? Yes. The corporate tax rate is 
what was Clyde Corp's tax liability as a result of the sale of that asset? And you might be thinking like, well, aren't they an S Corp now? Why would there be a corporate tax liability? S Corps don't pay any tax at the corporate level. It all gets passed on to the individual shareholders, right? Generally speaking, yes, but not when there's a C Corp that switches to S Corp status and has an appreciated asset from its days as a C Corp and then sells that asset within five years. So it doesn't look like the answer is going to be zero here. Letter D, probably not. Instead, the answer is A, 3,570. Why? To determine Clyde Corp's tax liability from the sale of the asset after converting from a C Corp to an S Corp, we need to calculate what's called the built-in gains tax. And this tax applies to the gain on the asset that was appreciated before the S Corp election. And that asset was then sold within that certain time period after the election, which we know is five years. Now, the tax basis of the asset at the time of the S Corp election, they tell us $50,000. And the fair market value of the asset at the time of the S Corp election, $75,000. So that asset had appreciated $25,000 while it was still a C Corp and there's a built-in gain there. But if they didn't sell this asset, then there'd be no built-in gain tax. But the sale of the asset for 67,000 triggers the built-in gains tax. And the corporate rate they tell us is 21%. So first we have to calculate the built-in gain. We said that's 25,000. The difference between the basis of the asset, 50,000, and the fair value of the asset at the time the C Corp became an S Corp. The actual gain on the sale is the sale price 67,000 compared to that same basis of 50,000. So the actual gain is 17,000. The built-in gain was 25,000. So for the built-in gain tax, we use the lesser of the actual gain or the built-in gain. Since the actual gain is 17,000 and that's less than the built-in gain of 25,000, then the built-in gain tax will be calculated on the actual gain, which is 17,000. So the tax liability would be 21% of the actual gain. 21% of the $17,000 gain is $3,570, and that will be Clyde Corp's tax liability as a result of the sale. Letter A is correct. So they didn't just get taxed on the fact that this asset had appreciated from the days as a C Corp. They got taxed because the asset appreciated from its days as a C Corp, and they sold the asset within how long? Five years. Five years of the day that they became an S Corp. If Clyde Corp would have held this asset for five years and then sold it, let's say they did that and then they sold the asset in the sixth year or the seventh year, well then they would have been an S Corp now for more than five years. So that asset would have been sold. If there was a gain on the sale, the gain just would have been passed through to the shareholders on the K-1. So that's where the tax planning comes in. Do they sell that asset right away just because it's worth 75,000 at the time that they convert from C to S? Or do they wait five years and then sell it? In this question, they sold it right away. And they asked, what's Clyde Corp's tax liability as a result of the sale? Well, they're going to pay a tax. The corporation's going to pay a tax of 3570 Answer choice A. All right, you probably added 10 points to your TCP score already. But will you be ready for a question on trusts? All right, this trust question asks, what is the trust's accounting income? And a trust's accounting income is usually the income available to the beneficiaries of the trust after expenses. So it tells us a trust earns 30000 in rental income, 10000 in capital gains, 15000 in interest income, and incurs 5000 in expenses. What is the trust's accounting income? Can we just add up all the income, 30000 in rental income, 10000 in capital gains, 15000 in interest income, that's 40, 15, 55000 and then incurs 5000 in expenses? Is the trust accounting income 50,000, letter C? Is it that simple? No. You have to know what income is allocated to the beneficiaries and what income stays with the trust. Rental income, that's allocated to the beneficiaries. So give me 30,000. But 10,000 in capital gains, that stays with the trust. So forget about the 10,000. What about 15,000 in interest income? Yes. That's generally allocated to the income beneficiary. So we're up to 45,000 of income. Now we'll subtract 5,000 in expenses. And the answer is 40,000 is the trust accounting income. Answer choice D. The accounting income of a trust, we said, is typically calculated by adding up the trust income from interest, cash dividends, which we don't have here, rents and royalties, which we do have, and then subtracting any expenses. 
And when we do that, we get 40,000. Accounting income is the amount available for distribution to the beneficiaries of the trust. But capital gains from the sale of trust assets, the 10,000, that's typically not included in the calculation of accounting income. That's ignored for the calculation of accounting income. Why? Because capital gains are usually allocated to the trust, not to the beneficiaries. So this question asks, what is the trust accounting income or how much is available to the beneficiaries? And the answer is D, 40,000. So now we've seen five multiple choice questions on major topics from the CPA TCP exam. If there was a TCP topic that you're struggling with that you didn't see here, leave it for me in the comments section. And remember to like and subscribe because it really helps the channel out a lot. So if this score release didn't go as you had hoped, get yourself on I-75 with me, Darius Clark. Because the right teacher makes all the difference. Click CPA review, then TCP, and then you can choose between the monthly subscription for TCP or the one-time payment for 15 days of the TCP cram. I'll leave a link in the description, but go to i75cpareview.com today and get home soon.